Good morning. Good morning. How are you, sir? Wonderful. Good to Hi, see Debbie. you. Good to see Ron Hi. back there. Debbie. Yeah, the whole gang's here. Oh, good. Yeah. All right. Well, well we uh, love your agenda. <laughs> you love my agenda? <laughs> <laughs> it's very, I, I like to keep things simple. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, well, let, let's just start here. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the April District 3 community meeting. Uh, my name is Christian Horvath, and I will be your host for the next 10 months or 11 months. So, uh, with that said, um, today's topic is is everything and anything on the table that that you uh the people would like to discuss so um with that said i will open it up to any questions to start and then i can go over a list of things that have been going on and happening and and then maybe that'll also spark some questions so why don't we start uh with open and ron first person to put his hand up. So uh, go ahead and Ron, you should also make the announcement about uh, the historical, uh, uh, the historical that's, commission. That's why I raised my hand to make the announcement. Well, there you go. So, so go we are having this week, the city's 130th birthday and um, the museum is hosting an open house, which is kind of like our, our launch relaunch of the museum being open to the public it's on april 30th from one to four at dominguez park at the historical museum um what's making this one very special is that we're having a an exhibition of an artist named caesar hernandez and mr hernandez was a professor or teacher at the high school from the 30s until about the 70s and he influenced a lot of people he's got some amazing watercolors um, so we've got about a dozen um, of those watercolors showing up there. And what I found interesting in researching him is that he actually is a descendant of one of the scouts for um, Gaspar de Portola, who explored California early on. And um, his ancestors got one of the largest land grants north of Santa Barbara um, from the Spanish king. So he's got some pretty prominent connections in there related to people in Camarillo, but we have a really special collection. So we encourage everybody to show up at the museum between one and four on April 30th. Thank you, Christian. Oh, of course, you're more than welcome. And thank you for uh, for all your hard work on that. Hopefully you'll uh, be able to come too. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping I will. And, uh, you know, the city doesn't look uh, too shabby for 130. So she seems to be aging pretty well. Uh, all right. I see uh, Caroline has a uh, has a question. What's the time frame for the new playground equipment at Dominguez Park? So I guess let's just talk about Dominguez Park in general. Um, the and I'll give a little bit of background to the Dominguez Park playground equipment uh, that whole project was uh, I accelerated that to 2019 back in I think 2017 for that project to get done, uh, or at least to start. And uh, it didn't. Uh, it's it's not even really in progress, uh, at least from a breaking ground perspective. Um, COVID uh, got in the way, and then we lost our community services uh, director. And with that transition, that slowed things down. And then uh, the lack of communication between community services and public works uh, as a result of that change also slowed things down. So here we are now. Uh, I'm super frustrated. Uh, this project will not happen uh, during my second term, uh, as I had hoped it would. But with that said, here's here's when it will happen. Most likely by the end of this year, I would, uh, from what staff is telling me, we should uh, not only have the engineering done, but we should be going out to bid for you know the potential designs and and whatnot on the the project. Now we did have a community meeting uh, about a year and a half, maybe two years ago, where we saw some preliminary ideas, which were really spectacular and. And I'm hoping that those ideas will be um, kind of continued and then brought to life by an actual uh, design firm. 
Um, and when it's all done, it'll be absolutely fabulous, but it's, uh, it's most likely not going to go into construction until 2023. Uh, so that's the update on the playground equipment. Now, with that said, there was a, a variety of other things that I've tried to focus on uh, in Dominguez Park. So we had the, uh, the gas company do their work at the very back end of the dog park. And uh, that was, of course, to ensure that 190th uh, would not get shut down every three years for the gas company to do their um their required work uh, on the two major pipelines that go under 190th. Um, that project's done. And, and so as part and parcel of the Dominguez Park playground equipment project, we were also supposed to focus on kind of a revamp of that um, exterior walking path along the, the outside of the, the park area. The, um, so that should be happening uh, when that project also gets rolling. Um, the dog park, we have uh, put some monies into uh, kind of doing what we can do with the dog park right now. Um, and some of those monies were coming out of that, that Southern California gas project. Um, so you're going to see a new fence around the dog park. Um, we're talking about maybe putting like some exercise stations or new exercise stations around the pathway um some new benches and whatnot within the dog park uh new lighting in the parking lot surrounding the historical museum and the dog park and not not new lighting per se but um we have those historic light poles there and so what they're going to do is just get refurbished uh, and that's happening in in a couple other places too within the city so uh so those will look uh brand new uh, let me think what else uh, the Morell House finally has a new roof. Um, that was something we've been working on for a while. Um, and then adjacent to Dominguez Park, um, we finally now have, uh, it, the crosswalk hasn't gone in, but now we will have pedestrian access on the east side of Flagler uh, crossing 190th slash Anita, because that's where 190th turns into Anita. Uh, so they they redid the sidewalks with um, ADA curbs and uh, and then they should be repaint restriping the road there. Uh, I've already seen people using it. Uh, so now you don't have to cross on one side and then cross again to get over to the park. It'll be uh, far greater access. So, Caroline, I hope that answers the Dominguez Park question. And if there's any follow ups on that, uh, please, by, by all means, uh, raise your hand and and we can still stay on that. Yeah, Ron, go ahead. Are you doing anything with the fountain in the Heritage Square that <clears throat> needs to be redone? Yeah, so we've talked about that in the past too. That fountain, it needs a complete overhaul. And I'm not sure if it's something that can be refurbished or if it needs to be replaced, but it has been discussed. I will, uh, I'll try to get an update on that for you uh, as to where that stands. All right. All right, any other questions? And then I can always go to my list, so. Hey, Christine, how are you? Hey, good, Brian. Hey, um, what's the uh, status with the uh, Foundry building project? Okay, uh, well, I, don't, I haven't gotten any recent updates on that, but um, the Foundry project, I mean, they, they've done clearly they did all the demo on both sides so the the old dairy mart and the the foundry properties um typically after they do uh for a project like that after they do the demo then they go into a phase of like soil mitigations uh you know because that's of the toxicity right yeah, you know, that's there's what I thought was happening yeah so so it is uh it is probably uh possible right now that that's what they're focused on and then once they get clearance from la county fire who handles anything related to hazardous materials and whatnot uh and sign offs then they would move into the next phase but um what i can do is i can reach out to the uh the development team on that and just find out like where they're at and and bring that to the next meeting does that work right yeah, 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 just curious. Okay, good. All right, uh, let's see. We'll go to Diane and then uh, Jim and Debbie. 
Okay. Hi there. Um, I was a little bit late, so I don't know if you were going to cover it, but uh, what's happening with the uh, fire department and that uh, survey and, and their findings? How's that going? Okay. Well, yeah, let's talk about that. That just happened uh, this week. So um, as everybody knows, uh, Chief Kaufman was here uh, in February and uh, he is still functioning, even though he's retired from the police department, he's still functioning as our uh, interim acting uh, fire chief. And uh, when he came on board, one of the things that we wanted him to do was an assessment of the fire department. And we did this with the police department in my first year in office in 2015. Um, we brought in an, an outside uh, interim chief who then working with other uh, retired officers uh they did an assessment of the police department which was also kind of in a, mm -hmm. in a struggling phase back then and uh, they came up with about 112 or 115 different action items for what needed to happen in the police department uh, when chief kaufman came in as our police chief in in the fall of 2015 he basically had marching orders you know aside from bringing in his own vision and ideas as to what could happen in the department he had this list this assessment if you will for what needed to be corrected and fixed so it's kind of fitting that as uh as he retires as a police chief and and takes on the, that role as the fire chief that he is now that individual over to past year who was doing an assessment of the fire department which was also long overdue um and so that was officially released uh to the council on tuesday night and we did have a, uh you know a meeting over it and it's a great report and i recommend that anybody who cares about their fire department read it um it's it's not a hard read by any stretch um it's raw and honest it, it has um quotes from elected leaders from the fire department themselves from community members stakeholders within the community um and then it, it basically goes through in uh kind of sectioned off into different uh areas uh, what we need to do to ensure that our fire department not only is uh is a 21st century fire department, but, um, and I'll explain that in a second, but also uh, corrects any deficiencies or, uh, or areas that, that really need attention. And so why do I say 21st century fire department? Fire departments have been, uh, you know, working under the auspices of a model that is, is very outdated uh, for fire departments. And that translates into their MOUs, which are memorandums of understanding uh, for their, their contracts with the city. Um, it translates into how they deliver services. Um, uh, so, you know, one thing, this is a conversation that uh, Chief Kaufman and I have had over the years is, you know, where, how do we get the, the fire department into uh, kind of a, a future model? Like, what does that mean? And uh, in, these days, the fire department spends the vast majority of their time functioning in an emergency services uh, 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 position, right? They, they, most of their calls are for medical services. Um, so, you know, what, what does it look like and how does that department need to, uh, to change and flex? And that, that goes from not only uh, the way they deliver services, but also, you know, how are they managed? What type of staffing do they have? Um, and so they really dug into everything, uh, including the, the things that are required in the MOU, which is basically in many ways, you know, if the city every time you renegotiate a contract if you are not changing those mous and updating them then you are just perpetuating um practices that maybe shouldn't be happening and so we've i mean we've known this as a council and it's been something that i have told my colleagues repeatedly over the years we need to change but they they are always due to the way they schedule themselves uh they are always using far more overtime than any other department um and you know that has cost implications so how do we change that um every time a uh we have a medical call a fire engine or a fire truck has to roll with uh with that that rescue 
you know, and a lot of uh, it, we've heard that from the community. It's in the assessment, right? Well, why are you sending out, you know, an engine and a and a rescue when it's, uh, you know, it's not necessary? So really rethinking how we do things. One thing that you know, it's it's not necessarily spelled out in the assessment, but you know, that Chief Kaufman had said to me multiple times was, you know, uh, because of the amount of medical calls, our rescues should almost be patrolling in the same way police you know uh cars do because then they they're responding automatically you know they're not responding from you know inside a a fire station right um and you know in the assessment they even break down how much time it takes um firefighters and or paramedics to get up get into the you know get suited up get into their vehicles and get out right um that has an impact on on response times um one of the areas that uh, that's covered in the report and maybe why Mark has raised his hand is that many years ago, um, the fire department took control of uh, what we would call harbor patrol, right? There used to be uh, decades ago, a, a dedicated harbor master it was not affiliated with the fire department or the police department. It was a separate entity, but uh, sometime uh, a couple decades ago, they they assigned the fire chief the position of also being the harbor master and so we do have a fire station in the harbor um, and it is primarily staffed with uh individuals who serve on the harbor patrol uh so that that being a, a captain of their boat and and then also a, an additional crew person um so we're we're kind of looking at uh you know everything, every aspect of the department in this assessment. And like I said, I, I highly recommend that anybody go ahead and, and just read it. Um, I think it's it's very interesting. And I, whoever gets hired as either the new interim fire chief or, um, or permanent fire chief has, you know, a, a great deal of work to do. And, you know, in my conversations with uh, the fire union, they are excited about this assessment. Um, I think they are finally feeling uh, heard in a way they weren't before um, and feeling represented at all levels of uh, command. So uh, that's one aspect. Uh, one of the things that uh, discussed in the fire assessment too is how to change um, the way our division chiefs function. So uh, within the hierarchy of the fire department, you have uh, the fire chief, and then you have three division chiefs, and they um, they each take on a different role. Um, and, uh, and really, it was probably one of the most damning aspects of the assessment was that that system right now is not really working. And it's of no fault necessarily of the existing division chiefs, right? Everybody that's working there has just kind of come up through a system that probably made sense at some time in the past. It doesn't necessarily make sense now for effectiveness and efficiency. And so uh, there are recommendations to change the way the division chief structure functions uh, so that they are um, available more often than not, as opposed to coming in for two days and then gone for three. Um, and, and one of the things that's also recommended in there, uh, which we've talked about here in the past too, uh, is looking at uh, uh, working with Manhattan Beach, El Segundo, maybe even Torrance at sharing um, division chief, uh, division chiefs across multiple um, agencies. Uh, and there are uh, definitely definite benefits to that. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that there are cost benefits. We haven't you know, gotten into that, but where there are benefits is having more stability and having uh, at least two of the division chiefs working a 40 hour work week where they are functioning really in a more administrative fashion uh, and leadership fashion. And then having uh, between the three cities, having a division chief that functions uh, the same way battalion chiefs in larger fire departments do where they are covering multiple stations at any given time for major emergencies or whatnot. Um, and then the assessment does not talk about this, but uh, we had two separate items the other night. The first was all about the assessment. Zoom. And then the second uh, item we had was um, 
was a discussion that was brought back by some of my colleagues uh, related to LA County fire. Um, and so I'll just do a quick recap on that. As anybody might remember, um, three years ago, we had decided uh, to do a, a look at LA County fire. Um, and th that's broken into two phases, an initial phase uh, where they come back with, uh, with kind of initial numbers and, and information. And then a second phase, which is if you are seriously considering uh, going to their services, they will do a, a deeper dive uh, and then come back with like a, a final quote. Uh, as a part of that process, the numbers did not bear out. And, uh, and so I did not vote to go to a phase two back then. Uh, Councilwoman MD did not vote to go to a phase two back then. Um, but uh, the majority of the council at that time did vote to go to a phase two. Uh, with council member Gran at that time saying that he wanted to look at it a little more closely. Uh, when it eventually came to a vote of the council uh, about two or three months later, council member Gran had, and I, I think this is on his, his uh, website, which is still up, he had done a far deeper dive on that and on the numbers. And, uh, and he changed his mind and came to the conclusion that no, it did not make any financial sense to continue on with uh, further study of going to LA County Fire. Uh, that led to, of course, a, uh, a recall effort uh, by now Council Member Obaji and other individuals uh, in the city uh, who then uh, also worked with the, uh, the fire union at that time to try to recall Council Member Gran uh, based on that vote, that one vote. Um, so anyways, as we all know, Council Member Grand did not end up getting recalled. Uh, we thought that this item had gone away. This was a whole, uh, one of the main reasons too, to, to do the fire assessment. Um, at this point in time, when the council uh, changed last year, uh, that was one of the first things they brought up. They wanted to redo that count, county uh, study again. And so the other night, uh, the majority did vote to move forward with starting that process one more time. Uh, you know, I just I will just point out that in the time since we decided not to do the phase two study, L.A. County came out uh, that they're struggling. You know, they're struggling to uh, to pay their employees. They're struggling to keep their equipment up to date. And they put a uh, an initiative on the ballot in all the cities that use them for contract services to uh, to assess uh, property values uh, so that they could try to make up for the funds that they need. So, you know, it didn't make financial sense back then. I'm not sure if it's going to make financial sense uh, this time around. I know some of my colleagues are saying that they want to do due diligence, but uh, it's one thing to say it, it's another thing to beat you over the head with due diligence. And so I'm, I'm not quite certain if that's uh, sincere or not, but, uh, but regardless, this is the path we are going down. Uh, so we will be doing two things in parallel. We will be enacting, uh, the assessment. And as we enact the assessment, uh, and try to put all those suggestions and things into, uh, into play, uh, the city will also be talking with LA County about potentially, um, what, what it may look like to go and lose our local fire department and go to LA County. Um, and so there is now a, uh, the council also voted the other night to create a subcommittee um, to talk about the assessment stuff further and to talk about LA County further. Um, unfortunately, uh, that subcommittee is, is just made up of South Redondo representatives. There is no North Redondo representative on that. Um, and I did ask for them to put Councilwoman MD on there, uh, and uh, they refused. So uh, with that said, that's the update on fire for now. Diane, does that, uh, does that answer your question? Or did Diane leave? I think Diane's off. Okay. So uh, any, any questions that I can answer specific to that? And uh, Mark, if uh, I'll, I'll skip Jim and Debbie, if Mark, if you're raising your hand specific to that item. 
Sure, absolutely. Thanks so much, uh, Christian. Uh, yeah, and thanks for that wonderful summary for for uh, for everyone. Um, yeah, this a uh, whole separate section on Harbor Patrol, and this got a lot of interest from the uh, boating leadership. I think there were about 10 folks from different leadership positions in the boating uh, and harbor community online, and I think a half a dozen of them uh, took the time to do written comments. A couple of those were two pages ages long, so this generated a lot of interest. Um, uh, reviewing all of those, um, uh, two big things jumped out at me. Uh, one was that um, we need to maintain 24-7 coverage by Har Harbor Patrol, and by 24-7 coverage, that means immediate res response. Um, uh, some of uh, the writers seem to be amenable to the idea of having Baywatch provide coverage at night, but in the same breath, they says that that doesn't mean during the daytime. During the daytime, uh, Baywatch is all up and down the coast supporting lifeguards. Um, also, um, there was a talk about maybe uh, uh, cre uh, upgrading Fire Station 3, the Harbor Patrol, to be a full response uh, unit, but that clearly made the boating leadership uh, nervous. Uh, that, um, yeah, you can't really have these guys inland working someplace when boats are blowing up on the on, on the rock. So the big message was, yeah, you can't have coverage from a life, lifeguard boat that's not there or from Harbor Patrol officers who aren't there there in, in, the, in the harbor. But yeah, nighttime uh, coverage, fine, but there needs to be somebody by a boat 24-7. The assessment uh, accurately reflected a particular danger uh, uh, in our harbor in that uh, our boaters often leave the entrance and, at the south end of the harbor and immediately turn right and head north down down the coastline and they often really are just too darn close to the rocks they're in a hurry to get where they're going and so when they have a mechanical malfunction they're on those rocks uh, very very quickly and thus you you really can't exp uh, uh, get time, timely response either from some boat down the coast or from uh, officers uh, on call uh, in, inland. The second thing that you alluded to um, was the creation potentially of a new harbor master or harbor director. There were really two issues that kind of got a little blurred in the assessment. One that's fairly easy to solve is that apparently um, uh, during the interviews, the Harbor Patrol officers couldn't give a straight answer to who they reported to of the three division chiefs. Anyway, that one's pretty uh, easy, I think, to solve. The bigger issue is really the discussion of do we create a new uh, Harbor Master, Harbor Director. One suggestion in the assessment was uh, we could take one of our three division chiefs and move them over to the Crow's Nest office in the harbor and turn them into the uh, uh, Harbor Master big discussion there is do we as you alluded to um want a separate uh harbor master harbor director who we actually go out and look for somebody with harbor management recreational boating experience as opposed to reaching into only a pool of three guys you know and who knows whether any of those three guys has background in harbor management and recreational uh, uh, boating. And so, yeah, there were some pretty uh, intellectual and strongly worded comments that, you know, no, we don't necessarily need the harbor director to be from the public safety world. It might be much smarter to go out and find somebody who has background uh, in harbors. So those are the two big uh, takeaways I got. Thanks, Christian. Yeah, and I, I think, Mark, you know, in some ways the harbor patrol conversation almost has to be a third parallel in in all this conversation right uh and you know what they recommended was the, to your point um having maybe a division chief function as uh, specifically as the harbor master um they also recommended um having uh our fire officers who are assigned down there uh maybe only work from like uh, uh 0800 to uh uh, to like 10 p.m. or something like that, and then not have full uh, full coverage overnight. Have them, you know, uh, assimilate to either station two or station one. Um, so I think there's there's room for a lot of conversation here, and uh, and I would anticipate, you know, that there there does need to be change. I think we've known that for years. We've we've kind of gone in a little bit of a circular, uh, you know, discussion on this for many years. Um, but I think there's going to probably be, I'm just making an assumption here because I think a lot of this is going to happen when I'm gone. Um, but I, I think that, uh, 
there's probably going to be some middle ground. You know, I don't know that the Harbor Patrol needs to be under the fire department. This is I'm just speaking personally here. Um, but there's benefits to having individuals who are trained in the same way the fire department is to to have some presence down there. And, you know, in the past few years, too, we've also added a, a different component which didn't exist when I started here, which is we do now have also the police boat and police presence, you know, because um, years ago, Harbor Patrol people were actually uh, allowed to carry a sidearm and they were supposed to also function as um, as kind of an enforcement entity down there. But uh, but there were some rulings and, and laws that changed and they are not allowed to do that anymore. So we do need to have a police presence down there. So I, I think, you know, uh, what probably should happen is that there will be, as part of this assessment and as a part of that chapter, there's going to be much further conversation specific to that area. Um, uh, I would assume that the entire boating community will be a part of that conversation, as clearly you guys always are. Um, and uh, and then hopefully we'll find some middle ground that makes the most sense for uh, the safety and protection of the harbor and the boaters that are in there or any not just boaters actually any water uh, man or woman uh, and also makes sense uh, from the city's perspective as to you know how do we run our internal shops should that be its own unit or should it still be a part of the fire department I, I don't know i do know that this assessment is definitely the first step in the right direction of getting us to where we need to go and so i look forward to that uh, further conversation uh, before i move on to other questions are there any other fire department um related follow-ups to that before uh okay uh, let me just check diane Dwayne, are, are you is your question specific to fire department or something else something else Okay, I'll come back to you then after Jim and Debbie. Okay, Diane, did you have a follow up to the fire? Department? Yeah, well, my I read the assessment and I thought, hmm, pretty, pretty interesting and, and a lot of valid points were made. Yeah. Um, my worry is that they're going to go county. Um, I do know before our mayor was duly elected, I did attend one of his um, constituent uh, discussions and two things that have stuck in my mind was he wanted to get rid of the chain paying the chamber of commerce this i think it was at that time seven hundred fifty thousand dollars check he did he also wanted to get go county with um our fire department and that worries me especially as you said that um County's in trouble financially, and they were in, they've been in trouble for a while. And um, uh, I've got some friends in Hermosa that you know they seem to be happy that they've gone county. But I've also talked to people in Torrance where they went county and they didn't get what they were told they were going to get, and they are not happy. Well, Torrance actually is not county. Torrance has their own fire department. Then, then I misunderstood what so they were the surrounding about. cities that have uh, county fire are Hermosa. Um, the the Palos Verdes Peninsula, um, all, all the cities up there. Uh, Are they a lot smaller than us, though? I mean, we're a pretty large city. Uh, I mean, the cities up there are some some of the cities are geographically smaller, some are bigger. Uh, but, you know, the peninsula is probably the one area of the South Bay that really, truly has fire hazards. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Yeah. Um, and now that I work up there, I am totally in the weeds on, you know, the emergency preparation aspects related to fire hazards uh, as part of my new job. So, um, so yeah, it's a different nut up there. Um, Lawndale has uh, county fire services. Um, and I think that's it, like just in our, uh, you know, the cities that literally surround us. Um, so yeah I, the mayor has definitely been super focused on this for a long time uh, he even said the other night it's something he's wanted to do for years even before he was mayor uh and he he does say that he just wants to study it um but again i at, at this point in time i especially after the last time we did this where it didn't make any fiscal sense uh to do so uh i i don't see the the benefit in studying it again. Um, and what I would say is our assessment, going back to what I said earlier, our, our assessment of our own department shows how do you change the fire service to be more modern and more efficient and effective in, in the 21st century? How do you uh, change that model? And 
you know, if we were to go to LA County Fire, I sincerely doubt that they would do as in-depth of an assessment and change their model. As a matter of fact, many of the things we do as local fire departments, and this is all local to fire departments in LA County, is based on um, uh, best, you know, the practices of LA County Fire. Um, so, and, and in no way am I, uh, you know, trying to disparage LA County Fire. There, I, I work with the individuals in County Fire up on the peninsula now, uh, and they are all, uh, you know, great people. But I'm just saying, you know, here in Redondo Beach, it may not, uh, and most likely does not make the most sense for us. Uh, and I will close my comments on this by saying one of the other things that Chief Kaufman and I have talked about over the years is, um, is really looking at our public safety entities as one entity, um, you know, and, and it's mentioned in the assessment, if you read about the Sunnyvale model, where the police and fire department are intertwined, they are one public safety unit. And so uh, there's cross training, fire, firefighters are actually cross trained to be policemen and, and, uh, and police are cross trained to be paramedics and firefighters. And so there is truly a, a unique response system in that model um and uh and i think it's something that we we should uh, explore you know uh in this day and age you know just doing things the way we've always done it doesn't make sense and if there's a better way uh, to improve services uh on a go forward basis uh, i i'm all for that and always have been uh all right so diane we good there yep thank all you right. good all right so then let's go on to uh jim and debbie and then we'll go to Dwayne. It's Debbie, by the way. It's me. She has a question. I, okay. I have well, good, because Jim's been talking way yeah, too much. Way too much. <laughs> oh, you, you know that we're both talking. So I read your, your note for this meeting, and I went down and looked at the topics, and I was completely enamored with that homeless pop, top, top topic where you had all your data in there and you showed, I know I couldn't really understand all of it. But and you don't have to spend it's a long going thing. It's but it seemed like something excellent was going to happen, is what I saw. And I thank you for that, really. Well, I, I hope so, Debbie. Uh, I mean, uh, so what, what Debbie is referring to is in the in the e blast that went out, I, I shared about the Blue Ribbon Commission on Homelessness. Uh, which was an LA County uh, Commission, and I served as the co-chair on that for six months. And uh, really, you know, while we are making leaps and strides in uh, in homeless services, we are still falling short. And that's uh, um, there are so many factors that that have an effect on people falling into homelessness on a daily basis. Um, many of them are out of our immediate control. Uh, but the simple fact of the matter is, and I've this is an old statistic, but like a couple of years ago, for every like 220 people we were getting out of homelessness on a daily basis, another 240, you know, some odd people were falling into homelessness, right? So uh, the 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 battle and struggle is real, and what we were assigned to do was look at um, the issues that were uh, we were facing here within the county, and uh, specifically to LASA, which is the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority, uh, and governance, uh, transparency, and and we actually also spent quite a bit of time focused on Measure H, which passed um, uh, about four years ago and is a quarter cent sales tax. Um, increase uh, that has a sunset, uh, but those monies are supposed to be specifically geared towards homelessness, uh, you know, overcoming homelessness and homelessness services. Um, and they have been super helpful, but it, it hasn't been perfect. And so over the course of the six months, we not only heard from uh from people experiencing homelessness the the providers that are out there uh from cities um about you know just where there were issues and you know cracks in the in the foundation of this system and what needed to change and so we put together um and you know my whole goal during this process was to really come out of it with actionable um recommendations you know not fluff not something not a, not a big you know 
chunk of a book that was going to go sit on a shelf somewhere. I really wanted to provide uh, the five supervisors with something that they could actually take action on that would um, ideally have a dramatic impact on how we deal with homeless services going forward. Uh, and I, I think we did. Uh, and now to, to your point, Debbie, it's really up to the Board of Supervisors, you know, um, do will they agree with the assessment that we did and made, uh, which is all based on testimony, you know, uh, hundreds, if not, you know, over a thousand people were interviewed as a part of the process. And uh, so uh, there's a lot of facts backing up the the reasons why we we recommended this. And I will say, um, the commission was unanimous in, in our decisions. Now, the only thing that was missing from this commission was that Los Angeles, there was no representatives from the city of Los Angeles. And uh, LASA is a joint powers authority that is, uh, is made up of a, a union, if you will, of the county and, and the city of LA. And so not having them on the commission, I think was, um, was not helpful, but that was a choice that uh, Mayor Garcetti and, and the, the city council made. Um, and uh, they, they finally showed up to like our second to last meeting to, to provide some testimony or on their end. Um, and, you know, they said some extremely tone deaf things uh, in that meeting. And uh, I found it to be extremely frustrating personally because uh, I think they had an opportunity to be at the table and to help that process and they chose not to. With that said, um, we did send the recommendations off, uh, uh, I think at the end of March or the very first uh, week of April. And now we're just waiting to have the, uh, the county supervisors take it up um, and have a discussion. And uh, you know, I'll be petitioning them, of course, to enact uh, all these recommendations, and I and I hope that they do it unanimously as well, um, and that we really start to see uh, again some some dramatic changes that will have uh, you know super impact on on the entire system as it exists right now, and and really be able to effectuate greater change uh, for people experiencing homelessness in the future. Uh, any anything else, Debbie, related to that? Well, I, I just thank you for being on that. It, I, I did read it. I didn't understand everything, but it, it's the bit the most I've ever heard that is in writing and people of interest are doing something. So that's all I can ask for. No, thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Any other questions uh, related to homelessness uh, in the city You know, before we move off that topic? All right. Seeing none, then Dwayne, go ahead. Yeah, two topics. Um, one is I just want to get an update on whatever was going on with the AES issue, take down of the plant, um, if anything. And then the other one, I sent you an email a couple of weeks ago about um, curb number painting, if that's something that the city could get, get it, refer an agency to us or uh, something that could help us get curb number painting done. Sure. OK, well, let's start with, uh, uh, I'll start with, um, curb number painting, uh, because that that's uh, easier. The city doesn't do curb number painting itself. Uh, as far as I know, um, I can check with public works, but, um, that's, that's not something we typically do. I do know, you know, as long as I've lived here every year, somebody knocks on my door asking if mm -hmm. I want my curb number painted or repainted. And, you know, they, they have a variety of options that they will offer you aside from just putting the numbers you know they'll put palm trees or boats or whatever it is that you want um so if uh let you know i will uh and i don't let me just check here because i don't remember seeing an email about that from you so i just want to make did you send that to my gmail or to my city account uh gmail i think is march 28th anyway i just what i wanted to ask was that um, if you're not at home when those people come by, they don't leave a card or a flyer. So you just miss them for that year. And Got so um, I was wanting to know if like if somebody could contact whoever company that does that. I did a Google search and couldn't find them. So um, if, if somebody could send a flyer around saying, hey, uh, we can give us a number that we can contact them that they can come by and, and, uh, and do our curb numbers. 
Okay. And Dwayne, just to let you know, I'm not seeing uh, the email from you here and I, I don't delete emails. Uh, so, uh, so send it to me again, and then I will try to get you some information. Uh, I'll, I'll talk to public works and see if they have like any preferred vendors or, uh, or how, how that maybe uh, works. Okay. Um, okay. Now to, to your question about AES. Uh, so, there haven't been any major uh, updates with AES uh, recently. Uh, you know, right now they are uh, extended to function as a power plant um, until the end of 2023. Uh, as we all know, that was supposed to uh, come to an end at the uh, at the end of 2020, and then they got it extended for a year. And then uh, they got it extended again for another two years. Uh, the council has been united on this. We've fought against it, um, but uh, the powers uh, at the state level uh, within the CPUC, Cal ISO, uh, the California Energy Commission, um, they, they all basically decided that no, it was still needed. Um, I thought I had really good arguments when I went and spoke to those agencies uh, and using math because I think sometimes math and facts are helpful, uh, but they they did, I guess they didn't trust my math. So, um, so with that said, it's gonna remain open at least till the end of 2023. Um, what happens with the property um, and, and whatnot after that is still something that uh, I, I really have no insight on. Um, the owner of the property, uh, you know, had a falling out with our mayor uh and uh it's been contentious uh between them um i mean he he was initially going to sell uh us uh, a portion of the property to use for parkland and we were working towards that we had um we had secured some initial grants from the state to help in that process i mean they, they weren't going to help us do it all but it was definitely uh you know a piece of the pie um then when they decided that they were going to extend all that kind of went away so there's a lot of question marks as it relates to the site um ideally uh you know he would take down that that power plant and he would put something else up there the problem is of course uh you know with measure dd uh that passed back in uh, 2008, uh, any new zoning, upzoning uh, within the city of Redondo Beach has to go to a vote of the people. So it's really uh, on the new property owners back to come up with a plan that is gonna be accepted by uh, the public and, uh, and by you know, a, a future council um as to what may happen on the site uh so uh we'll see now uh some of the other things specific to that is you know the council has had discussions with southern california edison uh you know i've said this many times one of my goals has been to get rid of the power lines and to you know try to create a um you know a park-like atmosphere going from the power plant up to dominguez park um we we do know from Edison that those lines can come down as long as the power plant is no longer functioning and as long as the property owner is willing to uh to grant Southern California Edison access to their site because there's a switch yard down there but um but the the power lines can come down all the way to prospect for free that's that, that's the best part for free to up to prospect from prospect to the city border um the the larger 240 uh, kv lines can come down for free but the 66 kv lines which basically are the lines that then transfer into the smaller uh, poles uh, those can't come down they can be rerouted um, they can be put underground um, and so that's all possible and i think that came with like a 16 million dollar price tag uh, to do that but again, we can't start on any of that until there is movement uh, specific to the site, you know, the power plant site and a, a willing owner to kind of work with us. So uh, again, these are things that will now happen when I'm gone, uh, which saddens me because, you know, you want to see progress. But uh, but the conversations have happened. It's in the works. 
Uh, and if things move in a positive direction, then uh, ideally that, that is something that will change in the future, uh, hopefully before I'm dead. So uh, let me think, Dwayne, if there's anything else related to AES. Um, I think that's it, unless you had a follow-up question uh, that maybe I didn't cover. No, that's fine. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm going to go to Glenn and then uh, Diane. And Glenn, you'll just have to unmute yourself. How about now? Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay, great. Um, hey, I to you before about the stuff in our cats and particular the uh, our cat next to my house. Uh, uh, I an email. It, I'm not sure who. Uh, anyway, I don't know if you can read. Uh, Hey, Glenn, Glenn I'm, I'm just going to interrupt just to say that your uh, your audio, like you're breaking up. Uh, it's hard to hear you, but I, I think what, you know, what I did catch initially there was that, you know, we've been emailing about the uh, Greg Parquet and uh, and I will just send you, uh, I'll give you an update here because I uh, I did talk with our police chief about it. And, uh, and so we're going to see some, uh, I had specifically asked for increased code enforcement uh there uh in the coming month so uh that would be uh, keep an eye out but i the goal is to have uh repeated uh code enforcement out there uh to see if we can gain compliance and i, I did not provide him specific times i just kind of gave i forwarded over your email uh so that he would have an idea of of what's going on there we are increasing uh the code enforcement um team so uh let me know if if you see any enforcement going on and uh and if you're able to get your audio uh your better internet connection or audio uh just uh just uh let, let us know and then we can try to come back and hear the rest of your uh, question sorry about that um that's okay um I think we lost. Hello. You. Yep. Yep. Are you we're still? here. We're, oh. we're here. <laughs> well, there we go. Yeah. Well, let's let's try for a moment. See if we're out okay. Um. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um. I guess the follow up question would be, uh, in talking to uh, some of the park nets work that seems like this so is a problem at other parks. Do you have any knowledge of that? Yeah, I well, you know, uh, I think you're right. So this problem, uh, and and what Glenn is referring to is people not following the rules as it relates to dogs in certain parks. Now we don't allow dogs in every park. Uh, we we did pass an ordinance to do a a trial pilot uh, where they are allowed in specific parks and parkettes. Um, but that, that also came with a lot of rules, including you have to keep your dog on a leash. Uh, the leash had to be a certain length. You know, uh, you have to pick up after your dog and whatnot. And people are clearly not following those rules. And then that does not work for other individuals who want to use parks and parkettes. Um, so, yeah, if, if the public work staff says it's happening in other places, it most likely is. And um, and this is why we will need um increased enforcement because maybe if people start getting ticketed uh they will change their behavior and follow the rules um i mean this this we could extrapolate this out to any rule that exists in, in, in any local government right uh people are told to drive the speed limit and they don't right and then what usually helps change their behavior is a very hefty fine uh you know uh, or their insurance going up. So I, I hate necessarily to have to rely on a punitive system to get people to comply with simple rules. But uh, but if that is you know required, then that's what we'll do. And and Glenn, I will say one other thing I told the chief was that if we if you know stepping up enforcement does not make a difference here at the parkette, then you know I would then you know, rely on you to get signatures of, of neighbors to petition the council to remove that park at from uh, from being a, uh, a site that is allowed. Well, thank you. Uh, one one last thing we 
one at a time talk. Um, the sign, I, people seem to be either they're, they're uh, ignoring the rules or they don't understand that there are rules. They seem, uh, many of them have said to me that, oh, well, this park was opened up uh, for dogs. And I remind them that there's a sign out in front as, that tells them what the rules actually are. Uh, that particular sign is very small and the writing is very small and there's lots of little rules on it and it's, it is relatively easy to ignore or just not see. Um, we talked about maybe having uh, a larger sign maybe put on the on the fence gate in front that says you know dogs must remain on leash. Um, I'd, I have no idea if that would be effective but uh, along with some enforcement uh, perhaps a, a, a sign with large letters uh, uh, might be worthwhile. Yeah, I, I think I talked to Public Works about that, but I'm gonna just follow up on it and see if uh, if they can get me something out there this week, uh, just a bigger sign and, and a better placement of it so that, uh, so that we can see if that'll help too. It might, I know, I, I just figured, most people would follow the rules if they knew what the rules are tonight. And it's a lot of people are just following what other people have done instead of worrying about what the rules actually are. I would, hope so. I would hope so too, but sadly, not the case. Uh, <laughs> I, right. uh, no, I understand that. Uh, again, thank you very much. You're more than welcome. Uh, okay, Diane. Diane, you're muted. Go ahead. Now, I, now you're, you're unmuted now. Go ahead. Okay. Um, as a dog owner, I agree with the rules, but uh, people, unfortunately, will be people. Um, I was curious about what's happening with the residential tree ordinance. How, has that gone anywhere, or is that just in the on a piece of paper from um, Council Member Obaji? No, finding, here, yeah, yeah. Finding us fifteen thousand dollars for cutting down a tree. <laughs> yeah, let's let's talk about. I mean, I have a whole list of stuff here to to go over, but I wanted to make sure we get to the things you want to talk about first. Uh, so, yeah, the city has been talking about um, creating a tree ordinance for uh, at least two or three years, and uh, and we recently had a meeting where we we kind of took it to the next step, like the actual direction for uh, the the city attorney to draft a tree ordinance. Um, now, the one thing. Uh, I, I voted to to move the city attorney towards drafting an ordinance, but I did that with one reservation, which I very clearly expressed that night was that I was really not interested in this punitive aspect that uh, Council Member Obaji uh, and uh, and um, Council Member Nerenheim and the mayor seemed to to really uh, like, and that uh, was specific to uh, private property. Um, and and what could could or could not be done on private property, I, I think that you know that gets dangerous to me when we start telling people what they can or can't do with their property. Now we do clearly have rules and regulations and design guidelines and whatnot, and you know everybody knows you know you need permits to do certain things, and that's 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 all well and good, and and you could have and require somebody to. Uh, to get a permit to remove a tree um, and and require them to to place one. But where, where this gets a little wonky is that they want to if somebody doesn't get a permit, I think they wanted to uh, like find the person like up to fifteen thousand dollars. And they were basing that on, uh, as I recall, um, something within the tree ordinance uh, in Manhattan Beach. Uh, which which does have a fine now i think that tree ordinance is really specific to the tree section of manhattan beach which is a really unique area uh and we don't have uh, an area in redondo beach that is is like that 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 tree section of manhattan um and so i i thought it was a little bit dangerous and and i did you know communicate that a couple times during that meeting um so i want us to move forward with an ordinance and i want us to move forward with um you know just basically memorializing things that we already do 
as well within public works. So there's there are lots of things that our city arborist and our public works department requires of individuals and uh, and as it relates to trees. Um, so let's get that down on paper. And then really what the city needs to do and what I think everybody unanimously on the council wants is to increase our canopy, right? Um, and that has many benefits uh, to a city. Uh, you know, simply having more trees, good for the environment, but it's also good for our streets. More shade over our streets ensures that our streets have uh, longevity. Um, it, it, it has, uh, having more trees and shade in general helps with heat index issues not that you know redondo beach is is like uh you know any city that's inland but uh you know we do have uh, typically cooler weather than than a lot of cities because we have the coastal effect but um but planting more trees and just being um more specific and generative about how and where we do that um now granted in north redondo um we don't have uh what what uh most of the homes in south redondo have which is you know that that easement right after the sidewalk before the street you know that parkway if you will where you could plant trees so uh you know here it's sidewalk street and our roads are much narrower um and so we have to be really judicious about how and where we plant trees and i guess this is where you know thinking about private property comes into it um but but at the same time i think we should try to engender the planting of trees on private property without necessarily uh becoming overly punitive uh or punitive at all um so you know we do know that we have identified tree wells that are in the public space throughout the city that need to be filled and i think you know the city can take a a lot of first steps by dedicating some funding to filling those tree wells you know with trees uh that will grow uh you know and create shade and that's where we should really spend uh, our initial efforts here in the coming years is hey let's fill all those tree wells that are identified that don't have a tree in them that are already under the purview of the city um that's the most important thing we can do so it, you know if this ordinance when this or not if but when this ordinance does come back diane uh you know i will not be able i i want to support a tree ordinance but i will not be able to support it if uh, my colleagues are going to really uh toe a, a very hard line on that that um that fine and that penalty so we'll, we'll see what happens and i'm always open for discussion and, and compromise but right now that is uh that is one thing that doesn't work for me so and i and i don't think it works for most residents uh mm -hmm. when they're when they find out about it so uh nope. so this, this is a good example of where you know hey people need to show up and speak at a council meeting or send in emails or contact representatives because if you don't then you're not going to you know there's people are going to do what they want to do you know it's kind of like that whole housing situation right there was mm -hmm. over 500 comments from north redondo beach residents saying hey please put the housing you know the arena numbers allocate them throughout the city and they were still ignored so i i don't know you know we'll we'll see what happens uh am i still on mute no no i can hear you oh okay um oh shoot i lost my thought um oh um as far as the planting of well as you know in north redondo as you know a small place comes down and it gets sold and three condos go up um yeah. my townhome that i live in and i'm the front unit so i have a eucalyptus tree in the front yard which i love but unfortunately they planted it on the main sewer line so that in itself causes some issues yearly yeah. that i have to take care of um if they do put in rules where you know new housing goes up and they have to plant trees is there any any way that they are going to keep track of the developers and the landscapers putting trees on sewer lines or any of the water lines or anything else that are going to um affect the homeowner yeah no it's a great question and i think as part of like design guidelines and as part of uh you know permitting process that should be discussed ahead of time right if you're going to plant a tree uh in a new development scenario why don't plant it you know 
clearly right next to the line ah. because that that will cause issues not only for the resident in the future but it'll cause uh, issues for the city you know so uh yeah i i think that that's a good conversation to have as we go through the design guideline process and uh and the talk with community development about uh because but and or engineering, uh, you know, there's a few departments that are involved in that process. Um, but th thank you for bringing that up. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, any other questions related to trees or comments? All right, well then let's see, I'm gonna just go through my list here of things I made that we could talk about uh, or just mention. Uh, and then uh, clearly we have uh, about 30 more minutes. So um, coming up on Thursday, April 28th, uh, from 6 to 7.30 p.m., uh, there's going to be a meeting uh, to get public input related to parking requirements along uh, Artesia Boulevard. Um, as you all know, uh, the general plan committee uh, was was going on and as a part of that we did the artesia aviation uh corridor area plan that came to the council um almost two years ago uh about, probably about a year and a half ago and uh we voted to move forward with the acap and uh and part of that discussion was that we need to rethink uh the parking requirements and what we do on artesia and aviation uh especially as it relates to um uh, they're, they're just too uh, they're too overbearing right now, especially on new businesses that want to come in and make an investment. Uh, so we're we're having those conversations, but what we do want to do is get feedback from the public. So if you are available on uh, this Thursday, the 28th from 6 to 7.30 p.m., uh, if you go to the city website, there's probably a link for you to be able to join that meeting. Um, you know what? Hold on. I see that there's questions here in the chat. Let me go to some of those before I uh before i go to other topics um kelly writes that uh the district attorney denied manhattan beach request to break away from the da's office and have redondo beach do misdemeanors yes that is that is correct manhattan beach had been um in discussions with the city of Redondo Beach to take on their misdemeanor prosecution. Here in Redondo Beach, the city attorney has a dual function. He functions as a city attorney and he's also the head prosecutor. We do prosecution for misdemeanors here. Um, and we were uh, exploring the possibility of taking that on for Manhattan Beach, I believe at a, a contracted cost of like $300,000 a year. Uh, that would require us to hire another prosecutor. Um, but the DA, they had to get permission from uh, LA County's DA to be able to do that, and he denied it. Uh, I, I don't know if that's like makes that issue completely dead in the water, or if there's room for negotiation on their part. But um, but at this time, it is not moving forward. Um, I don't know that the uh, Kelly that he believes that we would not be fair in prosecutions. Uh, I've you know, uh, the LA district attorney has come down. He's, uh, I met with him, he's visited our homeless court. He sees what we're doing here. Um, and he believes in what we're doing here in Redondo beach, um, and is supportive of it. So I don't know what is behind him denying Manhattan beach, uh, that possibility. Um, but that, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens and I'm open to that discussion. Uh, the Metro bus station um, is almost finished on Kingsdale. How is Redondo Beach going to address the rising violent crime rate in Metro buses? Um, okay, so I'm not gonna be able to answer that completely specifically, but um, I'm not aware of uh, the rising violent crime rate on Metro buses. Metro uh, has their own security contracts for their buses. Uh, and that is, uh, it depends on where they are at. So sometimes, and that, that's either with the LA County Sheriff, uh, sometimes the city of LA. So um, they handle that, but I haven't heard anything about buses. You know, usually sometimes you hear things about the rail, 
lines or, or the rail stations. Um, I would assume that if there is any type of violent crime here within uh, the Redondo Beach area on a bus, that we would get immediate response from our, our local PD on that. But I can look into that, Kelly, and, and see if I can find any more specific information. Um, we will have at that metro station, um, there will be private security. Uh, and that the, the it's, it's just a bus station, basically. It's where all the buses, not just Metro, but Beach City Transit, uh, uh, G-Trans, which is Gardena's local transit, um, Torrance Transit, and uh, I'm trying to think, there may be one other local transit that, that'll come through there, aside from the Metro buses. So there will be private security uh, at the location. And then, of course, like I just said, we always have uh, RBPD as well. Um, okay, Marianne writes, has anyone looked at the design of the city of Redondo? Where is there available space to plant the trees? Anyone surveyed the areas where you can plant trees? Yes. Okay, so Marianne, I, I did cover that. We do have, uh, that's what I was saying. We do have an identified list of uh, tree wells that are in the public space throughout the city, um, hundreds of available wells. So that's that that already exists. And that's why I was saying that is where um, we should be applying our focus initially um, is with planting trees and, and getting the funding to plant trees in those existing wells. Um, is there a list of trees that are not roots invasive? Yes. Um, the city arborist has put together uh, a list of trees that we as a city uh, will use. It's a pallet, if you will, uh, and residents can use that as well. It should be on the city website. Um, I will check and uh, and put that in a future e-blast uh, if it's not, um, but but it should be on the city website for residents to, to find. Um, and could the tree ordinance be a part of building plans for a home? I think that's what we were just talking about. Uh, and so, we will yes I, I believe that that would be the case and we can talk about it okay mark king harbor amenities plan um let me see public boat launch ramp mast up dry yes yeah so uh we i think we touched on this at a at a recent meeting in january maybe but uh the king harbor amenities plan uh is is still underway i believe it's gonna um come to a conclusion sometime in early summer. Um, we've had some public outreach sessions. Uh, I was I took part in one about a month or so ago. Um, we've done some surveys. Um, it's interesting, you know, what, what was coming up in that survey. Some of it, I, I, you know, as a former Harbor Commissioner and now as a council member, I, I didn't agree with uh, some of the the things they were proposing, but some of it looked uh, quite nice. And now it'll just be a matter of, you know, what is going to happen? Uh, what are they going to propose in the final uh, in the final uh, iteration of what they put together? And then what would the council be willing to uh, to entertain and do? And then where would we find the financing to, to do all those things? Um, so and then Harbor Commission received a presentation for an inspection impressive ocean encounters facility. Okay, not aware of that, uh, but uh, but again, I'm, I'm totally open to the process uh, and what's going on. So uh, we'll see what happens there. And if there's any future public input, I will of course let anybody know, but Mark's information, he's on the working committee. And so he put his information there in the chat if anybody wants to contact him directly about it. Mark, you have a comment, go ahead. Yeah, just very little on that. Um... Ocean Encounters presentation Harbor Commission got yeah. that was very very impressive. Um, a gentleman who uh, runs a oyster grow out facility down in Carlsbad came up and he had beautiful drawings with uh, ideas about uh, educational things on fish grow out and shellfish grow grow out and. Uh, 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 when he finished up, the Harbor Commission unanimously um, voted to make a re recommendation to preserve Joe's Crab Shack for marine educational facilities to potentially include our own waterfront education uh, program uh, that's operating out of AES property right now, as well as the White Sea Bass uh, program. Um, as hopefully most people on the call know, uh, the City Council voted to be able to 
buy out Joe's Crab Shack, $750,000 on 60 day notice. So we have access to that property and Harbor commissioners and when city council people, you know, mentioned, boy, if we're going to spend that much money, uh, we better do something cool there, either put the boat ramp there or something else. Well, the uh, committee has decided the best place for the boat ramp is down at Moldy by uh, Joe's Crab Shack. So that uh, opened up, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, by Samba. Um, and so that opened up Joe's Crab Shack for a marine educational facility. And this thing definitely met the criteria of cool. <laughs> so the, uh, the only other thing I would comment on is we were a little slow to address what we wanted to do about dry boat storage, but we finally done that in the last survey. We had uh, three different locations for three different you know, types of, uh, of boats. And my general recommendation I've been making is that we spread the dry boat storage out across the harbor. That's something Coastal Commission likes. They don't like you clustering the recreational access all in one corner of a harbor. And so if we had small sailboat storage on uh, Mole B by the outriggers, we had some paddle craft on Mole C, you know, right here adjacent to this wonderful marine education. And then kind of the real storage, you know, for the keel boats uh, immediately adjacent to the boat ramp where obviously it needs to be. Um, so yeah, to me, when people ask me, I say, well, the answer is, you know, yeah, all, all three locations, but for different types of boats that fit perfect in those areas. So anyway, hope that's helpful. Great. Thank you. All right. Um, okay, let's see what else. Metro Green Line update or uh, it's the sea line now. Uh, there's been uh, walking tours. Uh, there was most recently one uh, that finally happened on the Franklin Park side of the uh, of the rail line. Um, they are uh, they're they're listening to people and and the feedback that I'm getting from individuals who have attended the walks uh, sounds positive towards you know putting the the future green line along the Hawthorne Boulevard alignment. Um, I did speak specifically with our new supervisors, uh, transportation deputy, uh, a couple of weeks ago. We had a meeting specific to this, um, and it sounds like Supervisor Mitchell is is also uh, leaning towards uh, the Hawthorne alignment. So, you know, from my perspective, I will just keep advocating with the Metro board members that I know um, to uh, to push for that alignment. But again, they're they're still in the studying phase here, so. Uh, this is something that again will happen uh, when I am out of office, but uh, you know, in the remaining months I have here, I will just continue to advocate on behalf of the residents there. Uh, the Friendship Foundation, uh, which was our January meeting, uh, they're going to be breaking ground in June uh, on that, which is uh, adjacent to Franklin Park. Uh, so that is great news uh, for, for us and that you know, decrepit old school building will be going away. And uh, we're going to have a beautiful new um, uh, Friendship Foundation campus there. Um, Perry Park and uh, had some skate features that were installed. Uh, that project had been approved by the council last year. Um, and no sooner were they installed, uh, there was uh, a lot of outcry and issues around it. So uh, it looks like they've kind of taken some of them down and they're going to rethink things and, and potentially roll something else out. Um, we also approved uh, skate features at pad 10, uh, which is down in the, uh, in the pier area, um, just to the uh, direct east of Kincaid's. Um, that is supposed to, I think, go into construction sometime this summer. Um, do, 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 cannabis update. Uh, the council is awaiting. Uh, we also are waiting for the city attorney to come back with an ordinance related to uh, what we will or will not allow as it relates to uh, retail cannabis and delivery in the city. Um, uh, I think we've got a far better plan that allows us to maintain local control than what is uh, potentially going to happen with the initiative that did get enough signatures uh, and will go on the March of 2023 ballot. Uh, so my hope is that we will get something in place and that maybe those proponents will decide to uh, not put their initiative on the ballot. Uh, Mark, your hands up. Did you mean to have your hand up, Mark, or no? 
Okay, great. Um, uh, so that's that. Um, I, I went to an awesome, so we were talking about Dominguez Park uh, at the at the start of this meeting. And uh, one of the projects that, you know, uh, I've been super supportive of happening there is that we, we now have a dedicated canine facility for our Redondo Beach uh, Police Department canine division. And uh, it is right on the uh, south side of the park, um, fully enclosed. It is awesome. Uh, you know, usually if you're driving around town, you may, you know, see one of our canine officers training their dog in like Perry Allison Park or someplace with open grass. You know, sometimes they do it in the middle of the night. Sometimes you'll see them during the day, but they'll, they'll try to do their training because they haven't had a dedicated site. And so now they actually have a dedicated place where they can go with their dogs and do training exercises and, and just keep the dogs in shape. Uh, it's awesome. We did the dedication ceremony the other day. Uh, the leadership redondo class of maybe it was 2018 or 2019 uh, raised funds for this, and that was their project. And so they were there. Uh, it, it was great. Um, we talked about homelessness. We talked about AES uh, code enforcement. Um, we, I talked about it a little bit, but, uh, you know, our code enforcement department move, we have two code enforcement officers. Uh, we moved them out of community development last year during budget. Um, and we moved them into, uh, into the police department. And so now code enforcement, uh, is supposed to be growing. We're in increasing the uh, amount of municipal service officers we have to help with code enforcement. There's a lot of things that we've put in place over the years I've been in office that require some type of enforcement. That could be uh, leaf blowers, could be, uh, you know, uh, single use plastics, whatever. There's, there's a variety of issues out there where um, it's one thing to have, you know, a rule on the books. It's another thing uh, as to whether or not it's going to be enforced. So to the point that we were talking about with Glenn and dogs in the park earlier, you know, uh, we will hopefully see uh, increased enforcement around some of the issues that residents tend to complain about. Um, all right, uh, future election redistricting. The council had a, a discussion um, a few weeks ago about redistricting. Now this happens um, every 10 years in conjunction with the census. So the 2020 census, happened it was delayed and postponed and so we're we're a little bit behind here because of you know covid with as it related to the census um but when all that data comes in then it's the city's obligation to look at it and ensure that our districts are cut up in a way that makes the most sense uh for where the population is right and uh, we all know that uh districts three four and five are the most populous uh, or the most dense um and so uh staff is required to come back to the council um with an item to talk about the changing and the finalization of district lines and if if population numbers exceed a certain percentage threshold, then you you absolutely have to change the lines. Uh, and if you fall within, you know, a certain number, you don't have to if you don't want to. Um, anyways, we had a preliminary discussion about this last fall, and the council asked staff to come back with a with a, basically a potential solution for dealing with streets that are divided. So uh, a good example, um, Maria between Anita and Diamond, half of Maria is in um, District 3 and half of it's in District 2. Uh, if you live on Harriman in, in North Redondo, half of it's in District 3, half of it's in District 4. And so the council said, hey, could we figure out a way to draw the lines where the entire street is in one district. You know, it's not like, you know, your neighbors in one district, you're in the other. Um, and, uh, and so staff did that. And, uh, and I thought what they did made perfect sense. Uh, it, you know, in many cases, um, the, the, the one area that I thought made the most sense to me was that um, they moved that line from Maria up to prospect. 
So like where you live, Lee. Uh, and, you know, in many ways, I mean, that area of Redondo is South Redondo. And it makes sense that uh, many of the concerns for those neighborhoods uh, are, they share those same concerns as their neighbors in District 2. Um, the council opted to just keep things status quo as is and not do anything, but I, I thought the, you know, the recommendations from staff made sense. They balanced out the population a bit more uh, than, than it was uh, and got it closer to, you know, the five districts being evenly uh, distributed. Um, but council opted not to do that. So for the next 10 years, we will just continue with, um, with the existing uh, district lines as you see them. Um, okay. This, uh, at this past meeting, this is a, an important one, and I'll just put it out there um, for anybody who is interested, but uh, we discussed and voted on creating a charter review commission. So uh, many people probably don't realize this, but the city of Redondo Beach is what you would call a charter city. Uh, there's two different kinds of cities. There's general law and charter. General law cities basically follow the, um, the state laws as is. Um, they, they do have local ordinances and, and whatnot, but, but they follow the general law of the state. Charter cities, on the other hand, like Redondo, we have our own document, if you will. We follow our own charter and we are allowed to actually go above and beyond state laws in terms of what we want to do. So we can't loosen up a state law, but we can be more restrictive if we want. Um, uh, our charter is dated. There's a lot of things in the charter that probably shouldn't be in the charter that, that should be in the municipal code. That way, future councils have more flexibility to uh, make changes when necessary as needed. Uh, so there's a lot of cleanup items that we need to take care of. Uh, and so we're going to start a charter review committee. Some of my colleagues also want um, I don't necessarily agree with this, but they want to explore the idea of uh, taking away elected positions for the treasurer, uh, the city clerk, and the city attorney, and make those appointed positions. Um, I, I would rather see those positions stay elected, uh, because then those individuals in those positions are responsible to the general public, and a city council cannot just arbitrarily uh, remove someone uh, from a position. Um, so again, uh, you know, that, that'll be, I guess, part of the discussion. But what, uh, what I need to do now is, uh, and each council member and the mayor will be doing this, is I need to appoint uh, an individual who is willing to serve on the Charter Review Committee, and I need to appoint an alternate. So uh, this is my first announcement. I'll put something in an email as well. Uh, and anybody who is interested, you know, feel free to email me. Uh, if you are interested in serving uh, on the committee. Uh, let me see if there's anything else. Uh, there's going to be a new community garden uh, at Alta Vista Park, um, or at least, you know, we've approved it in theory. Now it's a matter of uh, fundraising and, uh, and being able to build it out and then to lease out those plots eventually to residents. Um, do, do, do. And then I guess one of the, the bigger things is we are finally going back to live council meetings. So uh, we have been virtual since March of, uh, of 2020. And the very first meeting in May, we will be back in chambers. Uh, and when you tune in, our chambers are completely redone. Um, we were, it was a project that was supposed to happen. And uh, while, while we were, you know, we were going to move our, our council meetings to the library uh, for the time that that project was going to happen, but uh, COVID hit, and so we ended up doing meetings virtually. So we'll be back live. Uh, you'll see a whole new setup uh, in there. Um, uh, it's ADA friendly, so uh, there's not as much of a slope from the top of the room to the bottom. Uh, new screens, new video. Uh, as a matter of fact, I saw the assistant city, uh, not the, <laughs> I saw the city manager uh, doing a, a budget meeting recently. And uh, I mean, the, the camera uh, quality is extremely, it's all high def. It looks great. 
so yeah, we'll be back live, uh, notwithstanding, you know, any potential reason to continue the virtual uh, emergency if something happened, but uh, that's where we'll be. Um, I'm going to continue doing community meetings virtually for now, uh, and then, you know, we'll just explore whether or not to do them in person in the future. Uh, but for now, they seem to be working virtually. So uh, unless somebody has strong feelings on that, feel free to email me. And uh, I think that is it for all my notes here. Any final questions, comments before we close up uh, April's meeting? Uh, let's see. Hold on. OK, sorry. Stuff in the chat box here. Uh, what's the status of the Beach Cities Health District? Uh, Marianne, that project um, you know, I'm, I, I kind of keep loose tabs on it, but that is really under the purview of the, the elected officials for the Beach City Health District. I think, uh, I think they've approved to move forward with something, but, uh, and eventually will be coming to the city probably for conditional use permits and whatnot, but I'm not quite sure what's, uh, wh where they're at uh, regarding that right now um but but it but it is moving forward uh so what i would do is i would email the um any of the elected board members um and and ask them for an update and if you want i can always send you their their information um kelly so the redonda beach city council is seeking totalitarian control by switching from elected to appointed well i mean i i i don't know but i i know some people are interested in that uh, uh the, my colleagues um, I'm just expressing my opinion that I don't necessarily think that's a good idea. Um, uh, thank you, Aquina. Uh, and then let's see, Kelly had another comment here. Okay, that's just more about the Gascon thing we talked about. Uh, Bob, go ahead. Yes, uh, I have another uh, home in a complex and they have now gone to live meetings, but they keep them hybrid so that the people are not able to attend yeah. or are away, can still view. Yeah. Can you encourage hybrid meetings in the future? I think we are actually. Um, I think what's gonna happen is the meetings will, will, will be live and in person. The meetings will still be, um, filmed and go out over tv and over youtube but i think there's going to still be a zoom component um, for individuals who want to participate in the meeting over zoom even though we'll be live that person can still listen in and then um and then i think the the idea there too is that those individuals can still comment but you know you're just doing it um remotely so uh so we'll hear your audio. We won't see you, but we'll we'll hear you speak to the council. So I, I believe that is something that we directed uh, to happen, and and so that is the plan. Okay, uh, I'm not familiar with. I, I don't get it over television. The meetings. Got it. And you said YouTube. Is that a recording after the fact, or is that? Yeah, live? It's live. Yeah, it's live. So oh, okay. you can you can watch the meetings on YouTube. I think more people are probably watching the meetings on YouTube these days than they are on the local cable stations. But yeah, it's going out live. There may be like a, a few second delay uh, in the stream, but uh, it looks good and it sounds good. And then if we still continue to have uh, the Zoom aspect, then people will be able to, I guess, watch a stream through Zoom and then be able to participate uh you know with public comment that way as well and okay. then we'll, still, we'll, we'll also still have the e-comment uh capability as well on a go forward basis okay and your monthly meetings could they be hybrid as well or is that too difficult well yeah to uh, be honest with you i don't know if you remember but before COVID hit i was doing hybrid meetings i had started live streaming them uh the only thing that um that i hadn't done at that i was filming them so that people could see them but we didn't have a uh, a way for people to participate. Uh, you know, I didn't have a Zoom component at that point. Uh, I didn't even know what Zoom was. I just was live streaming them. So if I go back, uh, if I go back in, you know, to the locations that we used to meet at, I will uh, definitely live stream them again. And then I would just have to figure out how to create a, uh, a Zoom component where I could also 
hear and or see individuals i don't that 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 might be a little bit more challenging i um because i i may need somebody to help me uh manage that uh if i'm if we're in a live environment so but i i i'd be open to it okay thank you sure all right well if there are uh, no other questions or comments oh pat do you have a question you just got to unmute you got to unmute. I can't. Um. <laughs> um, you know, no one question I, I, I really uh, uh, that that sort of just been bugging the crap out of me is is uh, is is this term lame duck and and termed out uh, as you know uh, you know as, as being described as you know for you and Laura. I, I don't understand that particular terminology since everybody on the city council is basically going to be termed out except for a baji. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm not familiar with anybody throwing that around, but I'm sure. Well, no, they, no, it's really weird. I mean, uh, I even uh, heard uh, Laura MD refer to herself as a lame duck. And I was going like, this is that's really bizarre because we can't have a lame duck on a city council because you guys are legislators you know even yeah. uh even in our even in nationally uh they uh they do have a lame duck session but it's uh applies to the president not the congress still legislates yeah um, I, I i never you know listen i mean i know people think about uh you know if you're in your final months or whatever that you're a lame duck. i don't look at it that way you know i mean i'm doing the work up until the the last meeting that i sit on uh uh, I mean, to your point, every single uh, elected official right now is technically termed out or a lame duck with the exception of Councilmember Obaji because right. he's in his first term. So, uh, you know, it seems kind of silly. You know, we're all going to do the work until our terms uh, have been completed. So, yeah, I just uh, I just kind of wanted to push back against that particular thing because it has people kind of nervous because they think that they're, you know, basically without representation on city council which is a di wholly different thing you know so uh uh so, yeah so i mean you you're still capable of of legislating you know freely i'm assuming no i i, I am and you know i will continue to advocate for all positions uh and all opinions uh within my district and or the city uh it's just a matter of which way does the vote go you know so uh and whether my colleagues agree or or disagree with the positions that i bring forward you know which is just part of the legislative process as well okay um <clears throat> just uh, just a, a, a couple of quick things though uh, as far as the uh, king harbor amenities is concerned do, does the city actually have the money to do any of that stuff? Well, we have we have some money. Uh, we we got you know some money from Senator Ben Allen. You know, graciously got us I think ten million dollars. Do we have enough to effectuate say everything that is, you know, being talked about? No. Uh, we will you know any future boat launch we will go out for um, the Department of uh, Water and Boating you know grants. We. I mean, we had grants in the pipeline when I was serving on Harbor Commission years ago uh, to to build a uh, a boat ramp, and then subsequently, you know, we lost them because we didn't effectuate a project, right? So, uh, right. I mean, we will, you know, there'll be certain things that we go out for public money on. Uh, other things we're going to have to find money, you know, or other grants, or um, but no, it's not a. Uh, uh, you know, we, we, we don't have a, a pile of money sitting around to to do certain things. You know, we're, we're just in the process of either saving or looking. Uh, so um, is, there, uh, are, is there anything in the amenities that is being proposed that actually will generate, uh, you know, uh, revenues for the city? Mm, not necessarily. Uh, I mean, public amenity. I mean, so. A public amenity like a boat ramp will generate revenues, but whether that makes the the functionality of a boat ramp cost neutral or run in the red, don't know. But but you know we have to people have to remember that public amenities 
don't necessarily, they're not revenue generators for cities. Public amenities are meant to be public amenities. So it's like a park, right? A park is something that serves the residents, but it doesn't necessarily, it ends up costing us money. You know, even like the Performing Arts Center, um, you know, that is something that generates revenue, but it also costs a lot of money to, to run a performance arts uh, center. So um, I, I think, you know, the city always operates from, we would like to have anything that's generating revenue create a cost neutral position, uh, but most times it does not. It is usually um, cost efficient. So uh, we would just have to see, you know, what, 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 what happens. Uh, ideally, what you want is you want a balance of public amenities and and revenue generating amenities that can also help supplement you know public amenities and and so in the harbor imperior you want to try to you know since we we don't have a project happening there now we're, we're going to want to or a future council is really going to want to weigh how do you find um, balance so that it is self-sustainable on a go forward basis that's key you know i talk about sustainability a lot in terms of in the environmental uh, aspect but i also talk i have always talked about sustainability in terms of uh our finances and um and the harbor enterprise should ideally uh as we continue to get it up into uh get it out of a level of disrepair where it is and into a you know, a quality, you know, harbor, um, it, it should become cost neutral at some point, if if at all possible, but we'll see. Um, let's see, uh, just uh, one question about the uh, skate park on the pier. Uh, is that a coastal dependent use? Uh, skate park? Well, I, I, I wouldn't personally think it's a coastal dependent use, but the California Coastal Commission is usually the final arbiter on that. And I don't believe that they uh, they issued any um, any concerns related to that. So, uh, you know, there there may be some flexibility with things that are public amenities, uh, you know, that they have leeway on. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, let's see, uh, you know, According to my knowledge of the CEQA lawsuit, the, uh, uh, there's a, a view corridor coming from uh, uh, Zuliger Park South. And, uh, and so I, what I was wondering if that skate park is actually going to impact that view. No. No. Not. No, view, view corridors usually, when, when we're talking about that, you're talking about um, uh, things that are being built up that will right. obstruct a view of of the ocean and whatnot and so i i don't think a half pipe down there is going to obstruct anybody's view of the ocean okay and then the other thing is just like uh um i don't i don't know if, i mean i i still don't know if measure c is actually a thing anymore because a, a loss in the supreme court but i guess if it's still being implemented uh putting a uh, a boat r ramp on Mold D uh, would violate two of the provisions in uh, Measure C. Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, yeah, I have no, to, because, I'd have to uh, go back and look at it. Um, if, the, 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 if, the, if it's because the uh, it's the same old issue. It's because the uh, 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 it doesn't do anything about surge, and it doesn't do anything about overtopping. In fact, it exposes the boat ramp to both of those things. Um, well, I think any, listen, any boat ramp that's going to be built, uh, whether it's at Mole C or Mole D, uh, there's going to have to be changes to the breakwater. Uh, and we've discussed this. There, there's other changes that will need to happen as a as a result of of that uh, and uh, related to surge and sea level rise like you know there's a ton of investment that's going to need to go into uh, all the moles on, on a future basis in general so uh, there's there are millions of dollars in costs that will need to be accounted for to ensure that uh, anything that is a public amenity or a commercial entity will be able to function for decades to come. 
uh, Mark's raising his hand probably because he, you know, he would say that, you know, certain aspects of the south break wall will need to be extended or whatnot to, to protect on surge, but I don't know. Go ahead, Mark. Yeah, uh, just quickly to answer your question there, Pat, um, uh, you have to really read Measure C carefully and understand the, hi the history and background. Have you? <laughs> the history and I have. background. Okay, <laughs> you're interrupting. Not yeah, right. I, I let Mark talk. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Let's be gentle, people. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, uh, obviously, yeah, I've read measures C in depth over and over and over, but more importantly, I've had long conversations with both of the authors, and I can tell you in particular, okay, um, Jim White, one of the two authors of Measure C, is a strong, strong advocate of the mole B location for the boat ramp. A lot of the verbiage you're reading, and I fully understand the confusion here, that some of the verbiage you're reading in Measure C was meant to uh, prohibit the ramp from going on mole A or mole B, okay? But I can tell, tell you, Jim, Jim, Jim White, one of the authors, he lobbied me strong over the years as we were looking at C and D, and he is just a huge fan of, of, of D. So, it, but I fully understand the confusion. Yeah, if you don't know the huge history and that though that was Measure C was being written to prevent it at mole A and mole B, I can certainly see exactly the points you're making are fi fine and logical and, and they're good questions. And then Christian, Christian kind of answered that in part is that, yeah, the Harbor Commission and the, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers have talked about extending the south stub of the breakwater specifically to address uh, issues at Moldy. I hope that's helpful. Thanks, Mark. All right, Pat, it's uh, we're 15 minutes over. I know. Yeah, yeah, I, I did. I didn't. I didn't. I'm sorry. I've no, gone. no, no, that's okay. I just I, you know, I want to make sure everybody's heard. So, all right. Well, thanks everyone uh, for coming this month. As always, we will see you sometime in May. Uh, stay safe and uh, be well. Okay. Take care. Thank you.